Hi everybody, I'm here, Mandy Hutchinson of Salt and Sass Games, and I'm here with Dr. Gray Atherton and Dr. Liam Cross, Assistant Professors, Psychology Department at the University of Plymouth. Welcome, thanks for joining today. Thanks for having us. Yes, I'm very excited. This is a topic for me that's near and dear to my heart, but I'm always happy to learn more. So can you uh, let us know, what are we gonna be talking about today? What is your point of research? Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to be talking about some research that we've been doing over the past, I think, four or five years, looking at kind of the overlap between autism and board gaming. Amazing. So for a lot of you, you're thinking, oh, maybe this is not something I could connect with. But maybe it is. Maybe there are people uh, that come to your store and, you know, they're looking for something to interject in their lives with people who are affected, you know, with different decisions and things that they have with people in their lives that have autism. So very excited to hear what you're going to tell us about today. So overall, what is the, the basis of the research that you're doing? I would say that overall, the basis of our work is that board games provide a really valuable hobby for many autistic people. And there are a lot of autistic strengths that really intersect with having a passion and even a kind of an increased sort of proficiency at playing board games. Okay, all right. And is this something, do you feel that a lot of people could benefit from knowing more about this in their life. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, so we've talked to a lot of autistic people about kind of their overlap with this hobby now. And yeah, people get a lot of different things from it. Yeah. So some of the key things I think are that it offers kind of a, a nicer space for socializing. That's kind of the opportunity of autistic ways of being. Um, a lot of people talk about things like the structure that's inherent to board games and how that kind of comes into all of the social stuff that happens around it and how that's, yeah, kind of really good for autistic people. Right, exactly. And I know I too am part of the neuro spicy crew. Yay. <laughs> so neurodiverse for those who are, you know, used to the other terminology. I like to be neuro spicy. So this is something that I'm interested in. I don't have autism, but I definitely have friends who are or people in the community that I'd love to learn a little bit more. So I think this is something that we can all benefit from. So let's jump right into some of the things you've been working on. So you've surveyed over 1600 board gamers. It's quite extensive, finding a significant percentage of neurodiverse individuals among them. Yeah. What do these findings suggest about the accessibility and appeal of board games to autistic individuals? So yeah, we surveyed um, just over 1,600 people, and we found that actually for most neurodiverse conditions, so things like ADHD, dyslexia, um, the prevalence amongst board gamers was kind of the same as what you'd find in the general population but autism was the one that, that really stuck out. So we found, I think it was about 6% okay. of our sample had a clinical diagnosis of autism, but a much bigger percent showed kind of um, high autistic traits within clinical ranges. Whereas, yeah, for most of the stuff, it was kind of about what you'd expect to find. Yeah. But, so what it, what it definitely suggests is that there's something about the medium of board games that is particularly appealing to autistic people. They try a game, maybe in childhood, and it clicks. And they continue that hobby into adulthood. And it, for a lot of, as we'll maybe talk about some of the qualitative work we did, it becomes a huge part of their social life. Right. So I think it's a really important topic for people that are interested in the board gaming community to know about. Right. And do you find that there are a lot of games that are, are accessible for people, you know, autistic people or people with ADHD or, or something mm -hmm. of the like? I think it depends. So autism is such a wide spectrum. So a lot of the people we spoke to who were kind of either already involved in board games as players or designers and things, they're, they're using any and all. Yeah, right. But some of the people we worked with that kind of had comorbid intellectual disability or had higher needs, there's certainly a much smaller range of games we found that, that will work with those populations. But there definitely are some. I think Dixit was one of the ones we probably had most success with. Definitely. So code names. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and and you mentioned this one here, so I have this um, um, as something we're going to talk about. But we've we've said it; we're going to jump into it. <laughs> so you insi you assisted in the development of Dixit Access Plus, mm -hmm. and used this game in your study, which you just mentioned. So can you share more about the use of this game in supporting people with autism? And I know you started touching on that there. Yeah, so this kind of happened, um, I guess, quite organically in the start. So we were working with a group of adults with autism and other conditions and ID was a big one also some down syndrome and various things and we tried games like um code names werewolf stuff like this but there was a lot of memory issues and other problems that meant people were kind of struggling right to play whereas dixit was one where we found that kind of people of all ranges could play 
and it worked really well. I think one of the things that makes Dixit really special is that it has this pictorial element. So it goes beyond language right away. And I think that that was huge for the group that we played with. And then we've then since used Dixit a lot in the other sort of studies with people that had just a range of needs. And I think how the pictures evoke all these emotional reactions in people make it something where they are willing to jump in and give it a try. Mm -hmm. And it's a really special game that way. Okay, this is great. And Dixit already has existed, but this is something that, it's funny, it's always something that I know when I was teaching, it was one that I found was great across the board, but then it was kind of unifying all the different students together based on pictures. I don't know, maybe it's an emotion thing. I don't know if that's something that happens a lot um, with people who are, you know, autistic. Yeah. Is that, do you find emotions as a regulator? I think that there are a lot of misconceptions sometimes about autism and some of the old research is like, they, they're not as into their emotions or they have less emotions. These are some of those, but we know that's not true about autistic people. They have very deep levels of emotion. And I think you're absolutely right, probably being able to interact with these very emotional cards and a lot of the clues people give for Dixit yes. are about emotions. I think maybe it's a very safe safe space for autistic people to then get into that kind of right. work and topic. And we definitely saw that. Yeah, for sure. We tried looking at that a little bit as well. Oh, okay, interesting. We? So using um, Dixit as kind of a, almost like a therapeutic tool to, to talk about hard to talk about things with children, like emotion or bullying or grief. Right. And these things using the Dixit cards. And we found that, I don't know, they kind of help children, I guess, kind of open up in ways mm -hmm. that, that, word, that words couldn't. Right. And to relate to the cards, it kind of brought something else out. Yeah. Right. I'm not sure if that's the best explanation. No, no, it, it, no it's it great. Is. But it's like telling a story. You don't necessarily need words to yep. tell a story. You have the pictures that can do that. So, no, I think that was a great Yeah, and I think having that kind of pictorial aid really helped yeah. the children tell that, that story as well. And it helps them um, get let people into their world because you aren't just telling your side. You're saying, look at this card. This is how I'm going to explain my clue or what I meant right. coming where I'm coming from that's really helpful I think absolutely because I think a lot of us sometimes look at and I know I'm guilty of this you know you look at it from your lens and not necessarily from how someone else might see it mm. and I think that sometimes happens in gaming right you're, you're trying to help someone and it's like no do it this way but that doesn't work for me All right <laughs> so definitely you stick it as well to try and see how people understand conditions like autism so would have once we taught people how to play dicks have them pick cards for something like autism yes and then talk about why that card represented autism to them right yeah we found some really interesting stuff from that yeah it was really it was well it started with i saw a picture of a card that was sort of like puzzle piece, puzzle piece. okay and i said okay my clue is autism and then everyone we were playing with an all autistic group had their cards and we were just like let's go around and share where people are coming from with this right i think so, that's wonderful yeah. you mean you all find that common thing they can do whether it's through the pictures through words and i think that's great and everybody feels involved which yeah. is really nice i love that that's amazing so i probably jumped ahead but this might be kind of important would you be comfortable in giving um almost like a definition or a bit more about what is autism because i think we were having a conversation before this and I was asking, you know, there are different types and you were explaining to me that things have slightly changed how that's defined. Yeah. yeah. Um, Con, you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> no, you are too. Um, so autism is a, it's a neurodevelopmental condition, which means that we um, often understand autism as some differences in brains or um, differences maybe in the way that there's kind of um, connections that are made in the brain. And it's also developmental because we diagnose autism as early as two, but it's something people are, are born with. Okay. So um, it has a number of different kind of traits. And one of the things that kind of stands out about autism is that there's so much diversity. So we call it a spectrum because there's a saying that once you meet one autistic person, you just meet one autistic person. Right. Everyone is very unique. Um, and that's also where we get the idea of neurodiversity which covers lots of different developmental conditions, but it's sort of that people that are neurodiverse do things a little bit differently. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but we know that there's a lot of strengths in these conditions as well. And I think that's what our work really tries to tap into is a strengths-based approach. Don't change who you are, become the best version of who you are. Yes. Yeah. I wish we had that growing up because that's not always, you know what I mean? They're 
you, you're getting struggling trying to work the things you're not so good at. But hey, if you're good at something, why wouldn't you just want to be better? Yeah. Right. I love that approach. I'm sorry. Is there anything else you wanted to, to add or, do, <laughs> or did that cover all the points? Yeah, no, I don't think so. Yeah, I think that covers it. I guess one thing um, that's particularly kind of interesting, I think, yeah. in terms of autism and board games is, so as Gray was saying, there was kind of autistic um, myths that have been changed in yeah. recent. And one is around theory of mind and perspective taking. And the way autistic people are thought to kind of not do this as well or not be as interested mm -hmm. in thinking about what another person's thinking. Right. But if we look at kind of what board games involve, like that's essentially what they're about, right? Like we all are agreeing to sit around a table together, do something together. And what you're doing inherently involves you thinking about what your opponent's doing. Are they right. bluffing you? Why are they doing that? So it's, I think, yeah, it kind of chatters some of those pollutions a little bit as well. Exactly. No, and this is great. And this is why these are really important for us to, to have these types of talks and interviews. So coming back to Dixit Access Plus and the work you were doing with that, um, how might some of the work you're doing shape future therapeutic interventions for games and autism? So one thing we've had quite a bit of success with is um, what I was talking about earlier, where we're yeah. using Dixit as this kind of therapeutic invention to both understand how people conceptualize something like autism or how that might differ across groups, say autistic and non-autistic people, and also as a, as a kind of therapeutic invent intervention to look at how children can kind of discuss difficult to talk about topics and and why gamification can be so useful for that absolutely and are these things that people can use in a classroom setting in life setting all of the settings is this something transcends all of that absolutely yeah so we had a grad student doing this in a few schools okay in the uk during what's a dedicated lesson time it's called ipe it's like inter interpersonal emotional oh okay development so so that's a set, that's part of the British kind of general curriculum. Okay. So every school across the country will have some kind of IP lesson. And uh, we use that time in a, in a number of different schools, kind of local to us, to do Dixit oh. inter therapeutic oh, stuff in smaller groups. Yep. Right. And yeah, it was. It seemed to work a lot better than a lot of the stuff that's normally done, which is kind of. I guess a bit more mundane, like emotional word searches, right. things like that. It mm -hmm. kind of opened up some nice areas. I think one thing that we find is that games are an icebreaker. If people are able to relax, learn about each other through a game, right. then they maybe feel more comfortable after the game right. to talk about deeper things because they feel like people understand who they are. Right. And I think that that can be applied for any game really to use that as an icebreaker with maybe younger people but I think adults too in a therapeutic session and it's almost like the games in themselves are doing that kind of naturally right. and emergently anyway without there having to be kind of an intervention developed and tacked on yeah they're already doing this yeah no that's really and do you find that 100% as someone who works in education games were always the icebreaker for all the different groups I thought it was really great uh, do you find that Sometimes the people that are also playing with potentially people who um, are autistic can affect their enjoyment or how they're taking in the actual game itself, like those outside factors. Right. So other people. Do you mean like um, when like a neurotypical person is playing with a neuro um, with an autistic person? That's a really good question. So that's that's something we're definitely interested in. So we want to do that. That's oh, that's yeah. the next. Okay, I'm jumping ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> I got excited. No, like next in our <laughs> as a project. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, we think so. We've a lot of what we've done with them, kind of the project so far, is autistic and autistic people together. Right. So kind of everyone around the table is neurodivergent. But there is this sort of area of research that's really exciting. That's about it's called double empathy. And it's this idea that we often ask autistic people to think about how what neurotypical people are thinking. Right. But neurotypical people aren't taking an autistic person's perspective. Right. And so games, as Liam brought up earlier, are forcing you, in a sense, to think about what other people are going to yes. do. Because that's your strategy. Absolutely. So if we can get mixed groups mm -hmm. doing that, then maybe we can also improve how you understand autistic people and vice versa outside of the game. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I just I was just thinking about it now. I'm like, yeah, that would be a, like a, a factor in how it's received. So throughout your career, what has been the most surprising or impactful insight you've gained from studying the role of games in social and educational settings? Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, it was we spent a year working with um, a school for children with autism and other conditions. Um, 
And this was kind of like a, almost like a last chance saloon kind of a school where they'd been through lots of different kind of, yeah, different SEM schools. Okay. And the, the change that we saw in some of the children, like from the beginning of the year till the end of the year, there was one child in particular who would start, start of the year, wouldn't kind of interact with the other children at all, would always do separate things. And coming up to the end of the, the year long program was actually starting to come in at first kind of sit on the periphery of the game and asking questions about it. And then by the end, actually playing and doing it, which was really cool to see. Hi. Hi. And do you, yeah, did you have any? So mine was also from that um, time period, but it was with the adults that we worked with okay. that had very high needs. Um, some people were non-speaking. Okay. And when we first got there, I thought, I don't know if this is gonna work. Right. Um, because we would try and play the game, for instance, Dixit, and they wouldn't remember which card they had put down or these types of things. And I just, I kind of I was a little panicked. And, um, but we had faith that it would, that it would progress. And so we had a graduate student that was running it. And by the time we came back, it was like a different group oh, of wow. people. And they were all playing independently. Everyone remembered all their cards. Everyone was winning in different ways. And it really taught me that you cannot judge. And also, um, games are transformative. Right. So I was really, I always remember that, to be honest. Yeah, I remember one of the staff members actually saying that like the staff themselves at the place learned a lot from it because they kind of got used to just over-functioning for people. And right. It's easier to just do it for them. And they'd learn how much these guys were capable of themselves by right. watching them do this. Just learning exactly yeah. by doing yeah. that. And do you find a uh, different, like uh, the different ages made a difference with the approach to games, like an adult versus children? Yeah. And I think different games worked well with different age groups. Right. Well. So a lot of the kids really love kind of the games where you get to trick people, like the social deception <laughs> games. Yeah. Really like Love that. Loved, loved <laughs> Werewolf. Really didn't blend well with those games as much, did they? Yeah. And I think that was partly because they had kind of more memory issues and things and would forget what their card was come the nighttime phase. Exactly. Or whatever. But I also don't think they kind of enjoyed that trickster element as much, right. whereas the children got a lot of really? of that. <laughs> I think when we talk to some adults, um, some autistic adults, and we say, what do you think about games like Werewolf? They say, well, I have autism, so I'm bad at that. Oh, okay. And when you play it with the kids, they have none of those preconceptions, and they are so willing and love them. Right. They haven't internalized that message yet. So I think that that is a big factor, and it's interesting. It is. Yeah. And when you ask them about kind of the strategies they're using in the game, right. it's really interesting to hear how the... They're definitely doing mind reading. They're assessing body language. Oh, they're absolutely. trying to kind of fake stuff to lead people to believe with someone else. They're doing all of that kind of high level theory of mind stuff that right. they're often thought not to be able to do. Exactly. And this is why in the classroom, when we're using we're, uh, games in the classroom, we are looking at some of these types of things that games are, and I don't say testing, that's not really the word, but building. some of the building things. Yeah. See, that's why they're the experts. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, building, exactly. Yeah. So these are things that you can you can actually see. Yeah. You know, so I think that's wonderful. And the age difference, I could definitely see that point you're making about, you know, older generation or, you know, adults. They were told yeah. that's not something you can do. Yeah. And children have that, you know, almost innocence or purity of like, I've never, I haven't been told that yet. Yeah. Or socialize that way. So Clay. that's a really important point, in my opinion. <laughs> they got really good at it as well, didn't they? They were playing with them. They were feeding us most of the time. So yeah. good, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And with the different versions of Werewolf, I'd be like, all right, we're going to play the superheroes. And they say, oh, this is that character from this. And this is the, so it's that they connection. Love the mechanics yes. as well. Oh, I love that. They're really yeah. needed by the end. <laughs> Don't you love that? You're oh. like, okay, fine, I'll leave. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. See, that's how you know your job's done. <laughs> yes. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. So now taking a look at how do you envision the future of board gaming in educational and therapeutic contexts, especially for supporting neurodiverse populations? So I think one thing I've kind of realized or learned doing this is we spoke to a lot of different people who were all kind of doing this in their own classrooms. There's got a lot of people trying the same stuff, but there's no kind of, I guess, standardized framework or manualization for pulling best practice that right. people are doing. So I think that's probably really what needs to happen now that all of the people who are already doing all of this great stuff yeah. can somehow get together and figure out what bits are working and how to, to kind of do it best everywhere. Because at the moment, it's just kind of, if you have a teacher that happens to be a board gamer, they're probably trying it in class. Right. If your teacher's a musician or something else, they're not doing that. Right. So yeah, I'd say that like standardization is 
is what's needed next. Right. And do you feel that there is enough attention toward that? Like that could happen sooner or is this going to be more of a slow progression? I'm not really sure. Yeah, it's more of an opinion, actually, I guess, more than an actual fact. I don't see it happening organically on its own anytime soon unless someone yeah. can find a way to do it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, man. I think also, at least always my experience in school was that board games were sort of, okay, classes ended early, you can play a board game. It's a, it's a time, it takes up time. Right. But we now, I think there is a more research, at least there's more awareness that games should maybe be part, the main course. Absolutely. As well. And Liam's absolutely right. If you have a teacher that already is plugged into that, they'll be doing that. But maybe we need to include informal training. We need to get the research out so people know there's evidence. Yep. It's evidence-based. Right, exactly. And maybe people can try and learn about board games that aren't naturally involved in the community for their classes. It's selling it to those teachers who, yeah, aren't already right. don't see the benefit in it. Because we kind of came up against that ourselves a little bit, didn't we? Some of the teachers thinking like, oh, this is just a fun activity. Yeah. It's game. Right. It's not class. So they're not learning it. And that's the mentality you have to get away from, I find, for some people. it can School can be informative and fun. That's you know what I mean? It's, it's like, well, a, right? that's, that's it. You're learning. You're having fun. I mean, I thought that's what we want for everybody. So... I'm on the bandwagon with you how <laughs> this happens, but I think you're right. It's going to take some time for that to become a standard of practice. I think some exposure as well. The more people see it working, yes. like the more yes. yeah. less resistance of me. And I think it also goes with the trend in education of us realizing that it's not just about learning kind of your... your For the test. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. It's, it, we need to be teaching children to be good sports. We need to be teaching them to be yes. good peers. We need to be teaching them to... Um, to be patient and to pay attention to what other people are doing. And that's the social development that's missing a lot. And 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 teachers that could use games to naturally build those things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I wish I had that when I was younger. I didn't like to speak publicly at all. Mm-hmm. Nevertheless, talk to other people. And that definitely would have been something I think that would have brought me closer you up, yeah. Yeah, to other people. So here's hoping that uh, becomes a staple in classrooms at some point. <laughs> Yeah. So considering your research, what advice would you give to game designers looking to make their games more inclusive for autistic players? I know we touched a little bit on this, but uh, delve into it a little bit more. So I guess firstly, um, they already are, right? Like autistic people are really overrepresented in this hobby to just they're already getting a lot out of it. Um, secondly, I think autistic people are so different. What works for, for one part of the spectrum isn't necessarily going to work for the other. Um, in the data set as well, we've made this data set completely open access and available to anyone. Fantastic. So board game designers were interested in, say, looking at what themes work for autistic women or what mechanics work for younger autistic boys or whatever. Right. They can go into the data set and sort the data by the parts of the population they're interested in to see what kind of stuff works for them. Mm-hmm. They like. Yeah. And I guess for me, they're, for, for the, a lot of people on the spectrum, as Liam said, they're already involved maybe in board gaming or or the challenge of board games will not um be too much of a stretch that's fine there is going to be a proportion of the population that have co-occurring um other comorbidities like for instance intellectual um disability where it it is um going to be harder and i think that one really nice direction that board gaming um is going in the industry is making kids versions Right. So my first kid, Tan, my first Carcassonne. And those, I think, could be a really nice scaffold for people that are, um, that that need more help understanding the game uh, to maybe build those skills and then probably maybe graduate to the real full-fledged. Right. Yeah. And And it's, well, it's interesting because game designers, you know, you look for, well, you hope (laughs) that people are looking for, you know, if people have uh, challenges with color or seeing, you know, sure. so you're hoping that these are things that are being checked. So what's adding that to make sure, hey, this works for this subset of yeah, people. Yeah, so yeah. I'm hoping again, it becomes a, one of the things on the list that we're, we're checking for yeah. going forward. And then I have another question. Uh, a lot of board games you're seeing are coming into the digital realm. Do you find the, a difference between the tabletop like analog versus the digital with um, people who are autistic people? We haven't specifically tested any okay. kind of like board game arena or right. game versions or anything, but we did ask some questions about it when we did the survey. Okay. And for neurotypical people, on the whole, they tend to prefer the um, like the analog version, the in person. Right. More. 
Um, autistic people were the same. They also preferred the in-person version, but the, the different, the gap was smaller okay. than it was for neurotypical people. Okay. But I also think it probably depends from like my own experience a little bit on game as well. Like again, like werewolf, you're going to lose everything that makes it great. True. Sure. Like, right. A game like through the ages, it's really nice not to have to do all that kind of nitty gritty bookkeeping and it's exactly. it up. So I imagine, yeah, it somewhat depends yeah. on game too. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wasn't sure if it was something you had looked at or looking at. So um, I guess we kind of did with the D&D &D stuff a little bit. They were all okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah, because now they have programs there that you can do uh, RPG playing or D and D online yeah. as well. So, okay, and role playing is something as well that you were looking into. Yep. In the study. Yep. So, um, well, so so Liam and I have since so we've always been interested in role playing games, right. um, particularly studying uh, autistic players because kind of anecdotally, it's again a lot of autistic people are interested. In that, and we also know that there's actual D and D therapy for autistic people. I did some accounts for D and D autism as well. The state, what? I think that one. Oh, yeah. wow. I didn't know that. This is new for me, so yeah. I'm learning things too. It's, it's really cool. And um, so, so we ran um, with uh, one of our graduate students again. We did um, Waterdeep, very yeah. famous uh, yeah. D and D campaign with all autistic players, two groups, right. and then we interviewed them afterwards, kind of about their experience doing it and people really loved the accessibility that online lends that okay and there are going to be certain games that will work really well for online but for the for the role playing it meant that they could play so we had care um we had players from all over the world oh wonderful. so they were able to come together and meet people from Brazil and we had people in France. And, yeah, and I love that. So it can be really helpful the Absolutely. online aspect of gaming. I think. Yeah, especially for people who might not have a like a, a space and a group right. to play with in yeah. person. Right. So they're not missing out. It yep. just might not be in person, but they're yep. still getting that experience. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. I and I've learned something here now today too. So another resource for me. So thank you for that. So based on your findings, what should industry stakeholders and educators know about the benefits of board games for diverse communities? <laughs> I know this is a, a big topic of discussion right now online. Right. So I think from our research, we found that autistic people are definitely kind of more involved and more represented in this hobby. And there's definitely a few things about the hobby that kind of work really well. How okay. kind of autistic people? I think one of the big ones we heard from a lot of people is that when you're playing a game, eyes aren't on you, eyes are on the board. Right. And then all of the other social stuff happens around that and it offers kind of this alternative social vehicle uh -huh. for communication that has the the rules and the structure that autistic people like built in okay and that was one of the things the big ones um something else a lot of people talk to us is so there's a term and you've heard like special interests or passions yes. that are common in autism and this is something that autistic people kind of get very engaged in and can be a draw to other stuff and there's kind of a lot of overlap as well between common restricted interests or um special interests like animals Transport, trains, mm. this kind of popular board game themes. Right. There's a really close kind of overlap there that a lot of our participants talked about, kind of being a draw for them and being really helpful mm -hmm. for them to kind of keep them engaged and passionate. That's it, passionate. Because I know when you're passionate about something, right, you want to be more involved, you right. want to play, you want to be a part of it. I think that's really important to be a part of something. Yeah. So, yeah. One thing I would say as well in terms of good designers is that we know from education, for instance, that when we design things with neurodiverse people in mind, they end up benefiting the entire class, for instance, yeah. and making things more accessible is something that can only help. Right. And so I would say that it could be really helpful for designers or people in the industry to talk to neurodiverse people. What do they like? What works in some of these games? What could be better? Right. And that might make the entire the design better really for everyone. So until we have those kinds of conversations, there's all, lots of ideas about what could be better, right. but you have to go back to the, ex the real experts, which are the people with the lived experience for that. Absolutely. And I think that people are starting to do that a lot more in board game. Change yeah. is always slow. Yeah. It's happening though. Like we it are is, seeing yeah. that people are really pushing for that. And you know, the big, the big uh, sentiment in the gaming community is, you know, everyone is welcome to the table. Absolutely. That's it. So because if, we're, if that's the what we're projecting, then we do actually truly need to make sure that everyone is welcome. And that means making it more inclusive, mm -hmm. what you were talking about. Yeah. So 
Well, thank you so much for taking time to chat with me today about your research. It's been, I'm learning a lot and I think everybody else is too. We really appreciate you having you here. Is there anything else that you'd like to, to add that maybe we didn't talk about or have we covered all the points today? I'm like, <laughs> so I don't like, think there's anything I... <laughs> No, I well, think yeah. that was great. It was thorough. Look at us. We did a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much, and uh, we hope to, to hear more from you. Oh, thanks, thank Andy. You. Thank you.